Mentors. I'm Dr. Sheena Buba. I'm Dr. Benicia Williams. And together, we're Shanisha. <laughs> Shanisha. <laughs> Next time. Next time. Tomorrow. We have to. We're working on it tomorrow. All right. So today we have a very special guest, our dear friend, Dr. Rachel Wellbell. Um, We'll go into kind of what she's been doing during this COVID pandemic. It's very interesting. So I've actually known Rachel for 10 years, believe it or not. We met in 2010 um, during the summer between our first and second year of medical school. We did the RIC Shirley Ryan Ability Lab um, externship and we were paired together during research, doing um, looking at osteoporosis in patients with spinal cord injury. So we became like DEXA machine experts learning how to operate that <laughs> DEXA machine. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, yeah. And to kind of show you how small this field is of physiatry, I'll let Benicia, let, you, uh, let her talk about how she knows Rachel. Yeah, so um, after I finished residency with Sheena at Baylor, then I match at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth for my sports medicine fellowship. And one of my co-residents was Dr. Rachel Wellbell. And I think it's pretty cool that one of, um, we were probably the only place in the country that had three women PM&R fellows at one time doing sports medicine, which is pretty, pretty unique. Yeah, there were seven, seven fellows all together and three of them were PM&R and all women, which is pretty cool. It's awesome. So welcome, Rachel. Yes. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> really excited to be here. It's good to see you guys. All right. Well, why don't you go into a little bit of detail, kind of about your background in medical training and and what you've been up to, and kind of talk about your practice before COVID. Okay. So, um, going way back to college, I went to University of Wisconsin Madison, and then went to travel back home to Chicago where I went, did a master's program, did medical school at Chicago Medical School, also known as Rosalind Franklin, University of Medicine and Science. Stayed in Chicago for another year to do my internship, um, which I know you guys talked about last week, the different type of prelim years. So that was in internal medicine. And then went to New York City where I did three years of my PM&R residency at New York Presbyterian, which is the Columbia and Cornell joint program. And then moved to Fort Worth, Texas, where I did fellowship at JPS, um, also TCU, for a year. And now I'm back in Chicago and working there. So it's all come full circle. It has been mainly East Coast, but took a little bit drive down south. And west, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so since, you know, you did your fellowship in sports medicine, kind of um, tell us a little bit about how your practice, you know, what your practice was before, before March. So um, the Chicago, as many of people probably know, is a very saturated field for physiatry. Yeah. So I was lucky enough to find a job in a private practice affiliated with a major hospital system, but I basically had, um, I was the sole outpatient provider. Um, my goals were to be primarily sports medicine, musculoskeletal, um, but it didn't really turn out that way, which is okay. Um, and I mostly did general rehab, a lot of Botox, a lot of um, post-stroke treatment with that includes Botox, um, a lot of general musculoskeletal. And then, um, so I had outpatient clinic three days a week and then I did EMGs five days a week, half days. So it's a lot of EMGs, <laughs> which um, I wasn't necessarily looking for, but they're actually a lot of fun once you start to feel comfortable with them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then because we have my practice is the only physiatry practice in the South region of Chicago, the South like Western region, once you get outside exactly of um, the city, we have an inpatient rehab unit. So I, would sometimes do consults on the acute side for that unit, but I didn't really have any role in managing the inpatient unit until COVID started. Boom, boom. 
I would say she, Rachel and I would talk often and we had very similar practices, like with the outpatient, doing a little bit inpatient, then doing some stroke and doing consults, except for I didn't do EMGs and I do more of the fluoroscopy, which she had chose not to do the fluoroscopy. So did you do EMGs in fellowship, Rachel? I did. And the reason I did that is because I felt, I don't know what kind of job I'm going to go into. So I don't want to lose my skills. And I'm so That's glad it. that I did that. Because, yeah. yeah. Her, um, I was the only one that chose not to do. <laughs> I knew I was not going to be doing that. Yeah. And um, as you learn more about practice and how different payment models, um, EMGs are actually worth a lot of RVUs. So that's the way that I get reimbursed so or paid. So it turns out to be worthwhile in that aspect as well. For sure. And then I'm at two different hospitals um, where I do consults and EMGs and I'm the only physiatrist at one of the hospitals. So that's a really cool um, place to be. So I have, have the official title of Director of Physical Medicine Rehab, which I fell into. All right. <laughs> but, and that's um, in a very underserved area of Chicago. So that's a really cool spot to be in and to really help those, those people out. So that's what I was doing before this all started. So <laughs> since COVID, why don't you tell us how your practice has changed? <laughs> so when this all started, it was probably the middle of March. Um, mm -hmm. We all outpatient work basically ceased. So all non-emergent patient visits were canceled. So that included all EMGs all of my outpatients. One of my partners does uh, intrathecal baclofen refill. So those were considered emergent. So those patients mm -hmm. came in. And um, so then because I was only outpatient in EMG, I didn't really have anything to do. So <laughs> when you're talking about productivity also, then I wasn't also making any money. So fortunately my there are about six physicians in my practice. They, um, they were, everyone has been really great about sharing the work. And we, um, I started to cover some inpatient and this was non COVID, just regular inpatients. COVID hadn't really hit Chicago yet. We were probably about maybe three to five weeks behind New York city in terms of the big outbreak. So, um, I did that and then I actually got sick with, with COVID. So I was out um, for a week. And then also at that point, um, the end of March, early April was what coincided with the huge outbreak in Chicago where cases were, the percentage of cases were doubling every single day. And it was, it was a mess in all of all the hospitals. And the area that I work on the Southwest side was hit harder than most areas. And we could talk about reasons for that too later. Um, so then I come back to work and then the thought is we're getting all these COVID patients. What do we do with them? Um, or what do we do when these COVID patients need rehab? We hadn't gotten to that point yet since most of them were still in the ICU, they were on ECMO, they were intubated. But you knew they were gonna need it. Anyone yeah. in rehab knew that these patients are gonna eventually make it <laughs> to inpatient rehab. Exactly. And the only reason that I actually had thought about that because I was the one who brought it up to my partners is because I have so many good friends who are practicing in New York and they were telling me about all the things that they were dealing with now. So fortunately I had a little bit of a glimpse into the future to say we have to be prepared for this. So we had, so then the question was who was going to take care of the COVID patients? We really wanted to do. So I was asked, I suppose, because I was presumably protected um, from the virus and I was younger than most of the people in my practice, I would see these COVID patients. And, and you so, didn't have kids. And I didn't have kids too, because that, which, yeah, I was the only one in my practice that fit all of those boxes. <laughs> So. Yeah, lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so then I was the one doing it. And then I kind of was just kind of thrown back into the inpatient world. I had done like a week or so of non-COVID before that. And then I had gotten sick. So I really wasn't, I was still very rusty after about 
three years of no inpatient work. And, um, and we had a couple, we were allowed about five beds on our inpatient. To step back a bit, the way my inpatient rehab unit works is it's a floor in a regular hospital. So we have the gym in the basement that the patients travel to. Um, so then the question was, what do we do with these COVID patients who are needing rehab because they can't be in the regular inpatient unit? Um, because no uh, elective ortho uh, surgeries were happening and the ortho floor had a little tiny gym that they used for their patients, we basically had to um, beg and talk up to the administration to have some beds and that unit. So we just, we said, this is gonna be the COVID gym and the COVID rehab unit. And it was already a COVID floor at that point. Um, so they had made about maybe three to 400 beds we needed for COVID in the hospital, about 700 beds. So we mixed those COVID rehab patients in with the COVID patients. So then it started to grow. We started with one patient and then slowly, you know, I think I had up to five um, in the first couple of weeks. And then things got really exciting because on our non-COVID inpatient unit, there was a COVID outbreak. Wow. And that was when things took a turn. So we probably had at that point about 25 patients on our general inpatient unit who ended up all, te not all, probably about 20 ended up testing positive for COVID. So then they were automatically shifted to my unit, my COVID unit. And, um, and then we, that allowed us to have more beds because it was kind of like the hospital had no choice to take care of those patients. So now what we are, now we are today is we have 20 allotted COVID rehab beds. The inpatient, general inpatient unit is closed completely. And, um, and then since this has started, a couple of my partners has, has helped out with the caseload because it's, it's just too much for me to handle on my own. And that's where we are. Wow. That is <laughs> incredible. It really is. And we commend you for yeah, doing I'm that. Proud of you. Rachel Owl posted on our Instagram page. She sent me a picture of her in her full um, garb getting ready to round on her patient. <laughs> so I will tag you on that. Yeah. Thanks. And there's a lot of like, we, we can get into it depending on how everything goes, just about the administrative obstacles and all these things that we're seeing with, um, that has complicated the situation other than the medical aspects of it. We can get into that if we have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I think that a lot of people who are probably gonna watch this do do inpatient rehab and they're wondering like, cause we've had this discussion amongst our partners, like how do we navigate this when the time comes for us to have to start taking COVID patients in our inpatient rehab. So yeah. I think that will be very insightful. So some people watching may be like, you know, why do patients need to come into inpatient rehab? So can you tell us about a little bit of the diagnoses that you've been treating? And, um, you know, I've heard that some patients, COVID, you know, puts them in a hypercoagulable states. So are you seeing patients more with like after strokes and, you know, that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's two categories. The first one are the patients that have non-COVID diagnoses and then happen to test positive for COVID. So people who have had strokes or spinal surgeries and then they don't have any symptoms, but they just, now everyone's being tested that they have, they test positive. So that's one area that we're not really gonna talk about because they don't, they actually, I haven't really seen a lot of the COVID complications in those patients. So the ones that are typically needing rehab are the ones that, um, so the, the course that I've seen is they come in shortness of breath, um, you know, they, they develop um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. A lot of them are actually younger than I anticipated, like a lot of 40 to 50 year old, mostly males actually that we've been seeing. Um, and then they get intubated. 
And a lot of these patients are intubated for 10 to 30 days. Um, and a lot of them are also being put on ECMO because what the institution I work at is a huge um, cardio, uh, a heart hospital. And the patient that they put on ECMO um, because it just increases oxygenation um, because the lungs can't do it, they do a lot better. And they actually are being able to be um, extubated quicker. So all of, now all of Illinois patients that are requiring ECMO for COVID are transferred to my hospital. So they had to do huge things on the, on the cardiac ICU. So with the- And that's all of Illinois, not just Chicago? Wow. Yeah. It might have changed over the last couple of weeks as the cases are dying down, but um, at least for Still April left. and most yeah. of May, all of wow. um, Illinois. So um, because of that, a lot of them um, are having hypoxic or anoxic encephalopathy. And um, they also, it seems to be worse than other diagnoses that patients would have these in like stroke or um, some trauma cases. I don't really know why that is. Um, so that's the biggest one. Um, the other thing is that most of them are developing sepsis-induced coagulopathy. And that presents itself mostly in DVTs or um, deep vein thromboses or pulmonary embolisms. Rarely I've seen a couple strokes. Um, and that is predicted usually by how high their D-dimer is. So a, D, a normal D-dimer is, is, depending on the lab, it's less than 0.7, less than one. And we've had patients with D-dimers in the 30s and 40s. So um, now everyone is usually being placed on a heparin drip to prevent that. Um, the other thing, that we're seeing a lot is mostly just due to lack of oxygenation to other organs. So a lot of um, necrosis and in and, and, and fingertips and noses and toes um, and also critical illness, myopathy and polyneuropathy, which you see a lot, um, which is a lot, a lot of times you see it with anyone who's been intubated or been really sick for a long time, but I don't think I've, have a patient who hasn't displayed some some evidence of that. So those are the, the biggest things. Um, a lot of acute kidney injury. Some patients are requiring dialysis. Um, a lot of urinary retention, which I'm not sure if that is COVID specific or just, just due to the length of the illness and being immobilized. And I think um, those are the main ones that I can think of. Well, so you're seeing a lot, a lot of bread and butter things for people who don't know what you're treating on inpatient rehab. You know, we do a lot of stroke. We do a lot of um, traumatic vein injury, but yeah, like critical illness, myopathy. What that is, is when a person is so sick is that their body literally saves its, I think about it, saving its energy, energy to curing what is actually wrong with them and their muscles and their nerves stop working. So it's almost like they're paralyzed and it takes up to six months to a year for these patients to recover sometimes. Um, and they are looking at a long course of rehab that usually is gonna involve inpatient rehab, skilled nursing rehab and then outpatient rehab when they're um, able to leave the inpatient rehab unit. Um, and then also just seeing the encephalopathy. So Rachel had explained that they're seeing like an anoxic encephalopathy and what that is is when your brain's not getting enough air or oxygen, um, it globally affects the whole brain. So when like strokes and traumatic brain injuries, sometimes it's very specific part of the brain and we can kind of predict how the patient will act and recover. But when it's global, like all eating, talking, walking, everything is um, affected and it's just a harder and longer um, prolonged recovery. Yeah. And because most of, a lot of these patients um, are really young and they didn't really have, despite what you might be seeing in the media, a lot of these patients had no pre-existing conditions. So- it's Just mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of, and this is really tough um, for these patients obviously and their families because they were very healthy 30, 40, 50 year olds. 
and now their brain injury, um, it's so great. And it's not the thing with hypoxic um, encephalopathy as opposed to strokes is you normally like, like Benicia was saying, you don't normally have like weakness in a hand or an arm. It just affects mostly cognitive function. And you could look at somebody and not know, but then once you talk to them and see them. So these, these patients are having a really hard time having control getting or getting them to, to tolerate therapies and to participate and they're young and they're strong. So they're ripping off restraints and they're running down the hallway, but not necessarily knowing. And they're, and they're so confused because they've also been in the hospital, most of these people for six to eight weeks. If you guys see me looking at my dog is on the ground, like harassing me as he does every time <laughs> I'm on one of these lives. So if you see me saying no, I'm talking to my dog. He wants to jump in my lap. So. <laughs> Um, Rachel, are you trying any type of specific medications, any kind of neural stims? Have you noticed if anything has helped, hasn't helped? Are you having to do any? So the biggest, thing, yeah, the biggest thing is agitation. Most mm -hmm. of these patients are actually waking up. Okay. I haven't had to do any neurostimulants. Um, it's mostly just bringing them down. So we've used a lot of Seroquel. Um, we've used, I've actually started using, uh, doing, using some propranolol. Um, the other thing that medically we're seeing is, is a lot of them are having tachycardia. So the propranolol also helps it's with that. Right um, and I have used amantadine because, you know, sometimes we can it use, it works in both populations sometimes, but I haven't really seen a lot of, um, results with that. The biggest change is really just, or positive predictor. I I think has been time and just really giving these patients time on the acute side to get to a point where they can participate in therapies, which is really actually tough to get. How long are these patients staying in the inpatient rehab? It it's really it's really weird because it's almost impossible to predict. So sometimes we'll get patients who we think, you know, we predict are going to be there two to three weeks. And after two to three days of therapy, they just, they make gains so quickly. And uh, one of the biggest limitations that I, I forgot to mention before with therapies is their um, decreased oxygen saturation and tachycardia, which happens. So once they start exercising, they their oxygen saturation drops into the high 80s and their heart rate goes up until the 130s, 140s. And they often require Besides just a nasal cannula, sometimes they'll require high flow oxygen, which just allows more oxygen at um, a higher rate and a better saturation that the body can absorb or a non-rebreather, which is one of those masks that also just allows for better intake of oxygen. So that that is also a reason that they'll come to rehab because we know that they're not safe to go home when they're way they walk and they desat into the 80s. So in those patients, they, with a few days of rehab, they actually do really well and they're there for less than a week. But the patients that have been intubated for a month have been, um, now the ones that I'm getting to my unit have probably been in the hospital since March, early April. They'll probably be with us for four to six weeks if we can get it. Yeah, if you can get it, right. Super yeah. deconditioned. And what we mean by get it is insurance typically um, is the one that ultimately deems how long you can keep a patient into inpatient rehab. So you have, Rachel has to submit day, weekly reports to them and then insurance comes back and be like, okay, you got to discharge this person by this date. They're making gains or they're not making enough gains. Yeah. That's the, world, that's the way medicine works. That's the world. Yeah, and that's the world we live in. Well, Sabrina's on. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks for joining. Hey. All right, you guys have specific questions out there, feel free to write them down, Dr. Wellville. Please do. Um, can you guys hear him crying? Yes. He's crying. Oh, and now he's, I might as well just show him. There he is. He's oh. trying to get in my lap. <laughs> oh. He wants to be on the show. I need him. <laughs> um, that was another question I wanted to ask. You have some stats for us, Rachel? <laughs> oh yeah, so I can give you some Illinois statistics on the number of cases. Um, so 
I think this has started, I want to say around March 15th. I'm not sure when they actually started collecting data. Um, but as of last week, Illinois had 123,000 cases and over almost 6,000 deaths. Um, and obviously a lot of these, these are just patients that have been tested. And there's so many people that we know have had it and haven't been tested and people who have passed away from COVID and they're not acknowledging it as a COVID related death. So the numbers I think are actually higher. Um, some good news is that around April 15th, the percentage of positive tests. So this, these are everyone who's been tested and then the number of uh, tests of the, that group are positive was about 34%. So that's a lot of positive. And now it's about down, down 5%. So that's either because there's just fewer people testing positive or that the, 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 the end, the number of tests that, tests that are being performed are just greater. So I don't want to give false hope that this is actually going away, but I think it, it definitely is improving. Um, and then our number of COVID patients admitted to the hospital had been hovering around 170 up until about... Um, maybe the end of May and now we're around 130 so that's that's it's good um and then we've had about 1300 staff members test positive and we've had many more than that um quarantined at home for exposures so it's it's um it's pretty big do you, do you think this is going to be part of the new normal? Um, you know, we have a lot of medical students and residents that watch our shows. Do you think this is going to be implemented into their training? Do you think they're going to start seeing these patients um, while they're training? I do. I definitely do. Um, because we're going to see long lasting, maybe forever, um, complications from this, especially in a field like physiatry. You're going to see a lot of these um hypoxic encephalopathic patients aren't going to get better so you're going to see that um most people have return of their vital organs but some people are going to require dialysis forever so i do think that i also think that just like any virus that we've had over the last you know hundreds of years um it just might keep cropping up i don't know if it will continue to crop up i mean hopefully it it obviously gets better, but I think it's something that is going to be definitely should be implemented into the, um, the education for medical students. And the other thing that I forgot to mention that I've seen a few cases of is Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a, for those of you that don't know, it's um, a, it's a demyelinating disease where your body basically produces antibodies that attack, that attack your, your nerves. Um, and it's common after, um, I think this was like a test question. It's like Campylobacter is the most common, yeah. although I don't know. <laughs> um, and other viral illnesses. Right. So we've seen that with COVID. And another thing we've seen is something called ADEM or acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. And that's basically the same thing. It just happens to also infect your, your brain. So, um, and that's basically diagnosed, the um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is diagnosed with an EMG and a nerve conduction study. And the ADEM is usually seen with an MRI and you see a certain amount of um, hyper intensity, in certain images on MRI, so. That's a big thing in the pediatric population. I know a lot of pediatric patients are having with COVID have ADEM. All right, well, we have a question here getting into some of the administration you know, issues. So as a physician on the front lines, what are some ways that you would improve the government in response to the pandemic given the opportunity? That's a good question. Um, I think the most important thing, well, there's a few important things, but allocating the appropriate funds to, um, to give the hospitals and physicians and the patients what they need. Um, there's been a lot of um, like uh, in the media, a lot of like we don't get proper PE, and that there's no money for that, which is 
which is true. And I've definitely seen in my hospital, they kind of just make excuses and say, oh, we don't actually need this anymore. But the truth is, I just think we're out of it. And a, there's also been a lot of um, stuff that has come out over the last week about actually how, where money's going and actually how cheap it is to supply healthcare providers. The other thing besides that is um, funds to support the, the physicians and the team members who are doing this. Um, there's gonna be a lot of fallout yeah. and emotional that a lot of these providers are going to have. Um, there's also going to be people who are getting, healthcare providers who are getting sick and not, um, and aren't able to practice again. You know, they're get, getting sick because of, because of this, or even those few physicians who've actually um, passed away from getting COVID. So the other, um, the other um, thing, terms in terms of funding is we, I don't know if this is a case all around the country or just where I, where I am. So as we know, certain populations are affected much more than other populations. Right. Um, the numbers of the COVID patients in my hospital, I think it's 50% black, 25% Hispanic who are getting sick. And, um, a lot of the reason for that is these, these, um, people have jobs that they can't work at home. And I think that's a consistent issue that we've seen so that they're getting it. Um, and a lot of these patients also don't have insurance. So that also highlights, and it's really been opening up some of the really dark side of the medical system that we've always known about, but now I'm actually seeing, because we have so many of these patients who don't, who are underinsured or uninsured, and they can't get post-acute care. I, they can't, they're not gonna be able to pay these medical bills. So funding from the government for, to help these people out, um, I think is is where you know there's money should go as opposed to so many other places that it's going, and then obviously just um, a more uh, concise support and better accurate information from the government would be wonderful. Well said. Well said. That was right. an excellent question. Um, if you guys, anyone else has questions, please ask. Um, so one thing I kind of wanted to get into, Rach, because I always tell people, you know, you when it came to applying to sports medicine fellowship, you did extensive research. You knew every single um, PNR based sports medicine program. So tell us a little bit about your process when you applied and interviewed, and then how many programs. Yeah, so I am like a bit of a crazy person when it comes to this. So don't do what I did because it <laughs> is, um, it's completely unnecessary, but I know a lot of people, a lot of physicians, med students are very type A, so I get it if you have to do it. So I applied to every single PM&R sports um, program. And then I applied to the family programs that accepted PM&R. So how many was that? If you can give us, if you remember. I want to say I applied to maybe 30 programs. Okay. And I interviewed at, I want to say 20. Um, um, yeah. Maybe, maybe 17 or 18. Yeah. Um, and I spent most of my fourth year of residency traveling and interviewing. Um, and the reason I did that was obviously because it's so competitive, I wanted to give myself the best chance of matching somewhere, but I also wasn't completely sure what I wanted. And I think that's kind of a common theme with PM&R residents deciding, you know, we've talked, you guys have talked about this a lot, but if you wanna do sports, do you do spine? Do you do sports and spine? Do you do pain? Do you do unaccredited? Do you do nothing? And, um, and I didn't really know because I liked, I obviously really like sports medicine. I liked my spine rotations. I love doing procedures. So I kind of just went to all of the programs and made a decision like what place would give me the most well-rounded education to get to where I wanted to go. 
And now that I'm out of training, and I don't know if you guys feel this way, I wish I could go back into training and be like, oh, I wish I had learned or I had paid more attention or, you know, learned more just kind of knowing what you'd be doing. Because once you're out of training, it's really, besides reading and going to courses, it's really tough to, right. you know, bes and besides looking up to the people that you're working with, but, you know, they're also working. So it's, it's really tough to actually get to learn more. Right, unless um, you're going to a conference, which we can't like go, because we had all talked about like, oh, we need to go do some type of conference. Yeah. be fun, take a course. Yeah, and, yeah. and that comes obviously with its, um, with its own restrictions too, like getting the time off of work. And once you're out of uh, training, you, you know, you usually have to pay for that yourself. So, um, so that's why I did what I did, why I interviewed and applied to so many. Um, that's good. And then, yeah, I can talk more about those if you want or any specific. Yeah, we can see if, yeah, we can have to see if anyone asks any questions and, um, you know, we had the honor of seeing all the applications that came in for sports medicine our following year. So the good thing about JPS, I would say the best thing about going there, it is the largest sports medicine program in the country. We had seven fellows, which was like its own residency. And we had so much fun with each other. Like we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I would especially say like first, like four weeks of fellowship is not easy for anybody. And it's because, you know, you have finished your residency after four years, but your fourth year, like you're, you know, rehab, you just are perfecting and learning the business aspect, hopefully, and really honing in on what you want to do when you finish. But when you start your fellowship, it's like being an intern a year, intern again, sometimes, because it's like, it's a whole new system, whole, a lot of new people and just learning something new is not, it's not easy. Um, so it was definitely nice having, um, a group together that we could bitch and complain with <laughs> with that yeah fellowship was so fun um I I miss it a lot mostly from the camaraderie the people to bounce ideas back off back off of and it's just it was so fun and I miss it yeah it was it was a lot of fun um someone asked we have a couple questions in our um it says comorbidities have been a key factor for COVID complications. Can you provide your perspective on the role physiatrists play in advocating for healthy lifestyle or a, and or holistic health? Um, oh, can I can I brag on you a little bit? Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> speaking of a healthy lifestyle, Rachel is one of the healthiest people I know. You know, she would come in with like her yes, smoothie she did this every too. day. Ten yes, years ago, she, she did this too. Yes, she <laughs> eats very, very well. She had she was one of the inspirations on when I stopped eating meat. I was like, I can stop. Rachel does this. I can do this. And she's a triathlete. I mean, a beast of an athlete. She was. She'll get up and she ran one or two marathons during our fellowship year, which is not easy to train for. She was up early running. Um, she's trained for, she you did a triathlon. It was about this time last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, <laughs> she is the perfect physiatrist to talk about like just being healthy. And she inspires me because <laughs> I, I'm like, Rachel's, I'm like, if Rachel can go out and run 13 miles, I can at least go and do my hour workout class because <laughs> she, she will come in it'll be nine o'clock she's like oh yeah guys I just ran 15 miles I'm like who are you <laughs> how, yeah even like 10 years ago like we would eat outside she would like bring her you know Tupperware and like everything yes of course she has everything yeah she's like I gotta go I can't go out today I have to go and train for my train. marathon yep <laughs> and that yeah. is it was still Rachel yes well thank you I appreciate <laughs> that I did have Chinese food for lunch for dinner and lunch today dinner last night and lunch today so can't <laughs> yes it's a balance it's all about balance but no I would say we're all just to kind of answer that question we are all are very much advocates for all of our patients about eating healthy losing weight that is a huge impact on musculoskeletal injuries yeah yes um and in terms of COVID so there are a few people who have at have actually no um pre-existing conditions but almost every single person that i've seen had been have is obese with covid mm -hmm. so i think actually what, at least what i've seen is that is like the, the thing that people have had most common 
even if they didn't have diabetes, they didn't have high blood pressure, which is unusual to have, you know, to not have those. But, um, and then with that, they also, people who are, a lot of my patients who are obese obviously don't have good habits before they get sick. So they have a really hard time comprehending what they need to do to get better. So as a physiatrist, I think, you know, even at now that I'm starting to see more outpatients and I try to condone obviously healthy eating and exercise, I will give them examples of being like, if you get, you can't predict what's going to happen to you if you're going to get sick, if you're, no matter how healthy you are, if you, you know, have a trauma or um, have a stroke, it, those things do happen to healthy people, but your, your outcome is going to be so much greater and your recovery is going to be so much quicker, the healthier you are. Mm -hmm. And I'll even tell, tell some of my patients that. So I think mm -hmm. as physicians, we really have that, have that role and um so hopefully hopefully people will get it you know right. um you have another question that we can answer it says what is what are the top three conferences you would recommend Ooh, i know my top three i bet you Ooh, this is so tough saying. because it depends on what i don't know what are your top three right so my top three in residency obviously aap and r um it's a great time to network meet people that one for sure yeah. yeah for sure it's if you're a medical student it's great because they have the residency <laughs> fair if you are a resident it's great because they have a job fair and fellowship fair um that's where and she actually met her um fellowship directors so that was her wingman mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm like she is amazing <laughs> um and i would amssm is good if you want to do sports medicine um awesome. we also went to the um iof what is it international Sports orthopedics Sports. foundation so they do a lot of regenerative medicine and they often have a lot of stipends so you can go for free uh, mm -hmm. as residents yep and then spine intervention society is another one if you mm -hmm. know you can do interventional yes. spine um and these are all groups so spine intervention society and nas is north american spine society they're free for medical students residents and fellows so now is the time to kind of take advantage of that and sign up for for those groups and a lot of organizations now during covid they've like drastically reduced their membership prices mm -hmm. for, for residents and fellows. So take a look at those. Yeah, and a lot, we kind of touched on this last time for every conference that we tried to go to, we, um, if there was a, there's usually courses that are attached to them either before the conference or after or during, we would volunteer to try to be um, models for the, the ultrasound, anything we could do to get hands-on experience mm -hmm. um, and get these classes. Typically those classes are um, more, they're, not included into your um, right. conference fee. ACRM is another one, uh, American Congress of Rehab Medicine. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a very good, like, for uh, multidisciplinary rehab. So it's not just physiatrists that go there. So there's a lot of, like, speech, right. occupational, physical therapists, um, caseworkers. So it's really good for someone who's doing more, like, inpatient medicine, more general rehab. It's a great conference. AAP. I didn't go to AAP, but I, did you ever, did yeah. you go to AAP, Rachel? Yeah, I went, I think, two or three times in residency. That one, I think, is, it's much smaller. So it's in a lot of um, residency and fellowship, or I don't know about fellowship, but residency directors are there. So it's easier to network. Um, That's good. And it's less intense, it's less intimidating. I always felt that networking was very intimidating, and I'm not very good at it. Um, so, I'm an expert. <laughs> so it was That's nice. You guys need me. <laughs> yeah, like there's also the other one, um, the other sports medicine conference. The um, um, American College of Sports Medicine, ACSM. Yeah, I think that one has a lot of other disciplines. A yeah, lot of his huge therapy. conference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's another one that I was actually going to go to this year. Um, it's like a wellness conference um, and kind of like functional medicine. Because I think that physiatry has like a huge, I think, the, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of um, carryover to yeah. physiatry, but that was supposed to be in March and it obviously didn't happen. But. Oh, another conference she and I both went to separate years was we, we were very blessed in our residency where we were able to go to Kona, Hawaii for the Ironman championships. They have a sports medicine conference that's attached to the championships. And then you can actually work um, the Ironman 
in our program allowed us to go. They paid for us to go. It was amazing. Yep. Um, and the conference was ama- was great. great. They had um, Dr. Jonathan Finoff, who is huge in the PM&R sports medicine world. He was um, a speaker and gave several lectures. So if when the outside opens up again and you get a chance to go, I highly recommend that. Um, we yeah. talked about going, Rachel and I and our other um, co-residents, and so we're going to go in a couple years and um, <laughs> get some CME. So I yeah, that, that's a great conference. They also do a lot of, there's a lot of um, adaptive sports athletes there mm-hmm. as well, um, you know, participating in the Ironman. So you get lectures on adaptive sports medicine as well. So we'll go, guys. Yeah, we'll go to games. <laughs> we'll go root Rachel on when she's in the Ironman championship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been about 45 minutes. You guys had yeah. some questions. Yes. If anyone has anyone, drop them now. Oh, we can't forget. Oh, yes. Yes, Rachel. So we asked all our guests if they weren't a PM&R physician, what would they be? I was thinking about that. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, I think it kind of goes along with like, I think I would want to own my own like gym slash yoga yoga studio and be a either like a personal trainer or a yoga instructor and just like try to advocate and that's what I would do or I'd be recently I wanted to be, be a veterinarian it's weird <laughs> I don't want to be a vet I want to be a vet too that's I just love, love animals but yes. that, yeah, that's what I would do the yoga I can see that because there was plenty of times we would walk into the fellow's room and Rachel would have her yoga block on the floor and she's doing some type of position on the floor. Yeah. I mean, you're, I was like, yeah, as I've gotten older, things are not as easy. So you have to do um, a lot of injuries. Preserve. Remember, yeah. And Rachel's very, like we thought, remember we both thought we had like marfanoid. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Our hands are so us. long. Like, yeah. yeah uh-huh. We also both have full time. time. Yeah. <laughs> touch my elbows behind my back that's my own well very good okay hey i'm gonna um go ahead and exit off alive thanks again guys for joining us next week we'll have a really good show we um kind of brought up regenerative medicine and we will have two experts in the regenerative medicine field to give a little bit of light of it on what regenerative medicine is they are fellowship trained in regenerative medicine um, which is huge and they will talk a little bit about that fellowship as well so we'll have dr goji as and dr chris williams on so I look forward to talking to them next week and tomorrow tomorrow we have dr julia ayaforte um, who actually is, was one of dr wobble's attendings um, at coming cornell she does sports medicine and she also has an interesting story, um, and we'll t- go into detail about her and how she was working on the front lines in New York City with COVID patients. So, the COVID weekend. Thank you. Thanks for joining in, guys. Have a great Bye. Bye.